just want to thank you tonight, Lord, for uh, just all the kids that are here tonight, Lord, for everyone bringing out their their families, Lord, and, and just enjoying fellowship and enjoying the worship time. And now as we get into your word, Lord, I pray that you would open our hearts and minds and our eyes and just give us uh, the ability to see with those things and hear those things that you want for each one of us, Lord. I pray that you would uh, speak through me, Lord, that I would not get in the way, that I would not stumble on the words, but just uh, uh, let it flow, Lord. I just thank you for how much you love us and how much you reassure us through your word of that love and of the wonderful plan you have for each one of our lives. We thank you and ask you in Jesus' name. Amen. So tonight we're going to, hello, wow. Tonight we're going to continue on. We'll be getting into Daniel chapter 3 tonight. Now in Psalm 34, 19, it says, Many are the afflictions of the righteous. And though the author is quick to add, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. Yet the question still remains, why? Why do the righteous suffer? Why do tragedies occur to those who love the Lord? And I think that question has been brought into focus more often than just about any other question that people might have. And so we wonder, at least some do, why the Lord would allow such deep tragedy to occur to people who love the Lord with all their hearts. Now that's an issue some people are frankly afraid of. Some of you might be, I don't know. Some of you are thinking maybe, why should I surrender to a God who might allow horrible things in my life? Or you're afraid to give a verbal witness because this issue may be brought up and you have no adequate explanation for why a good God could allow suffering. And you're just hoping that no one will say, why do you believe in God now? Because you think you're going to feel awkward and say, yeah, maybe you're right. There can't be a good God if he allows evil to exist. And so you just sort of cave in. Now the three men in the story we're about to read tonight are men who dared to stand up while everybody else bowed down. And because of that, they faced the trial of their lives, a burning, fiery furnace. And this chapter is one of the most well-known in all Scripture and one of the best-loved Bible studies. I remember when I was maybe seven or eight years old, and there was only three of us at that point in time, and uh, my mother, in order to gain some me time, would take us on a Saturday and drop us off at the local church for summer Bible school. And this was one of the first stories that I ever really paid attention to. It's about Shadrach, Meshach, and I called him at that time Abednego, only because I didn't know his name was pronounced Abednego until much later in my life. But I want to look at these 30 verses in three different cuts, three different slices, if you will, because of three different truths and principles they bring out. The first one is that the world wants you to shut up. They don't want to hear about God. They don't want to hear about salvation. They don't want to hear about Jesus Christ being the only way. They don't want to hear about eternal life at all. They just want you to shut up. The second one, God wants you to speak up. He wants you to stand up. And the third one, and we'll see this toward the end of the chapter, your opponents may learn to look up. They may, as Brad was teaching us a couple of weeks ago, uh, look up to the serpent on the pole and to trust in it to save their lives. That we can look up to Jesus on the cross dying for our sins, that we might have eternal life with him in heaven. So that's the flow that we get as we go through chapter 3 of Daniel tonight. So we begin in verse 1. Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold whose height was 60 cubits and its width 
six cubits. And he set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. And King Nebuchadnezzar sent word to gather together the satraps, the administrators, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image which King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Now, satraps, if you're not familiar with that word, were uh, officials of the Empire of Babylon. They, they might have even been governors of different provinces, but they were high up there in the, the, the uh, hierarchy of the government of Babylon. So in verse 3, it says, So the satraps, administrators, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces gathered together for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had st set up. Then a herald cried aloud, To you is commanded, O peoples, nations, and languages, that at the time you hear the sound of the horn, flute, harp, lyre, and psaltery, in symphony with all kinds of music, you shall fall down and worship the gold image that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. So at that time, when all the people heard the sound of the horn, flute, harp, and lyre, in symphony with all kinds of music, all the people, nations, and languages fell down and worshipped the gold image which King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. So in effect, Nebuchadnezzar was in love with Nebuchadnezzar. The whole idea of this statue is him showing himself off. In chapter 3, we get another glimpse into this. But if we were to simply read this without the benefit of chapter 2, which we went through last week with Luke Widener, we would say, so what? This is just another example of a pagan king putting up another idol. But we do have the benefit of chapter 2. And a couple of ancient sources tell us that there is a 16-year gap between chapter 2 and chapter 3. It's a long time. So now 16 years have come and gone, and a lot of water has gone under the bridge. And since it was 16 years ago that Nebuchadnezzar had that dream, and Daniel interpreted it for him, his belief in the God of Israel has faded tremendously. Now in chapter 2, when he had the dream, nobody could tell him what it was, and nobody could tell him what it meant except for Daniel. And Daniel came and said, it means that you are the head of gold, Nebuchadnezzar, but after you shall arise a kingdom inferior to yours. You're not the only dog on the block. Somebody else is going to push you off the hill and be king after you. He's referring to the silver chest and arms on that statue representing the Medo-Persian Empire. So like I said, it was 16 years ago, and Nebuchadnezzar has been waiting all this time and he has not grown weaker. He has since grown incredibly stronger. And after waiting for this dream to be fulfilled, he now makes a golden image. I think he's trying to make a statement here. I think he's got something to say. He is, in effect, saying nuts to the silver and the bronze and the iron and the clay Nuts to the other kingdoms who will come after me. I am invincible. I'm going to make an image whose, not only whose head is of gold, but the entire thing will be made of gold. As if to say, my kingdom is an eternal kingdom, which historians tell us was the whole idea of the Babylonians in the first place. They insisted their kingdom would outlast even time. Now, this is important because so often we think, well, if we just give this problem a little time, if we just give that person some time, time will soften them up. Time will heal all wounds. Sometimes that's true, but not always. Sometimes as time goes on, a person doesn't soften his heart. 
but hardens it even more. Things can grow worse rather than better. So you might say instead, time wounds all heals. We have a warning given to us in the book of Hebrews. And in chapter 2, verse 1, it says, We must listen very carefully to the truth we have heard, or we may drift away from it. Now that's the tendency of people, of us, as we listen to the truth that we heard a long time ago, but we're not affected by it now. As time goes on, we drift away from it. There's some truths you may have heard as a child, and man, you think that they were pretty cool. And they were special to you, and they made an impact on your life, but not so much now as you're older. You perhaps have drifted away, as Nebuchadnezzar did, from a very ominous revelation that shook his world, but now he's not as affected by it anymore. You'll also notice the statue itself. It's 60 cubits by 6 cubits. 66 cubits by 6 cubits. You have to bow down to it or you'll die. And the reason that's important to me is if I fast forward to the book of Revelation in chapter 13, I read about another image that will be cast, another enforced worship that will take place around the entire world of the Antichrist. People are told to bow down to the image. In Revelation 13, 18, it says, Here is wisdom. Let him who is un has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 666. This is the number of a man. Nebuchadnezzar is the quintessential humanist, magnifying humanity and diminishing God. And that's what the statue was all about. But if we keep reading, we find that the demand to bow is met by defiance. There's three guys in the crowd who make a stand. We continue in verse 8. Therefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came forward and accused the Jews. They spoke and said to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, flute, harp, lyre, and psaltery in symphony with all kinds of music shall fall down and worship the gold image. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. There are certain Jews whom you have set over the set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not paid due regard to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the gold image which you have set up. I want to stop for just a second and, and go back to their introduction. These three names were not their given name, not their Hebrew name. They were Babylonian names given to them later. Their Hebrew names were Daniel, of course, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Daniel's name means God is my judge. Hananiah's name means the grace of the Lord. Mishael, he that is the strong God. And Azariah, the Lord is a help. On the other hand, Belteshazzar, which is what Daniel's Babylonian name was, means keeper of the hidden treasure. Shadrach's name means the inspiration of the sun, which they worshipped. Meshach's name is of the goddess Shak, which was the same god in essence as the goddess Venus. And Abednego means servant of Nebo. He was the Babylonian god of wisdom. So it's very obvious here, they renamed them simply to take God out of the entire equation. The God of Israel, the God who created everything, and give them pagan names, which represented their gods. So it's very simple to figure that out. So these three guys, they've done nothing wrong. And in fact, 
I think they would get our applause because they had the guts to stand up to the king. They loved God. And they served God. They were loyal to God's name, and yet they're facing the trial of their lives here. They are faced with an ethical dilemma. Obey the government and bow or obey God's command. I'm pretty sure God is the one who said, well, they're going to pick option number two. But that's still the dilemma that Nebuchadnezzar gives to them. Now, you and I face the same pressure. Different circumstances, of course, but the same pressure nonetheless. The pressure to conform. The pressure to not stand up or stick out, but to go along with the crowd and be quiet. To shut up. To blend in. To be like everybody else. Now there was a great intellect many years ago by the name of W.C. Fields. I don't know if you know who that is. Some of you do, I'm sure, but others have never heard his name. William Claude Fields. He was an older, portly gentleman with a big nose who loved booze and hated children. It's not me. I'm sorry. I don't love booze. Anyway, um, he said, he said, a dead fish can float, any dead fish can float downstream, but it takes a live one to swim upstream. Very profound. They're banking on the fact that everyone will do what everybody else does, that there will be a mass conformity. And in fact, in verse 7, it says, all people, all nations, and languages fell down and worshipped the gold image. But these three did not. They kept standing. Verse 16, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If that is the case, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. So verse 16 shows us the second slice of this message that I meant that I mentioned in the beginning of the chapter. The world wants you to shut up, but your God wants you to stand up. They told the king that they had no need to answer him in this matter. I think that's very interesting. That's their way of saying we're not at a loss for words here. This is a no-brainer for us. We already know what the answer is going to be. And we don't have to think about this at all. It says, if that's the case in verse 17, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. So notice the twist here. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. No explanation is offered. No long, elaborate explanation. Just simply, no, I'm not going to do it. We're not going to do it. We don't have to think about this. The answer is no. Now, couldn't these guys have done something different? Yeah, probably. Couldn't they have come up with a different approach? Possibly. Maybe a little rationalization would be fitting at this moment. For example, they could have thought, well, you know, Nebuchadnezzar, he's treated us pretty well. He's given us a good job and a good pay. And we should at least show our appreciation to him and just bow. Get it over with. Or perhaps they could have thought, it's really not idolatry if we just get down quickly and get back up and the rest of our lives will serve the Lord. Or perhaps they could have rationalized by saying, look, we're thousands of miles away from home. Nobody will see us. And besides, didn't God, through the prophets, predict that we would be taken captive and serve other gods in a foreign land? We would just be fulfilling Scripture if we were to bow. Maybe this is God's will that we bow. It shows you how warped we get when we start rationalizing. 
Sometimes it's very easy to bend the word to our own way of thinking or behavior. To say that this is okay because of that, or it's not a sin if I do this, and besides, God will forgive me anyway. These three men trusted that God would deliver them, but were determined to be faithful regardless of the consequences. We should be faithful to serve God whether the, He intervenes in our behalf or not. Our eternal reward is worth any suffering we may have to endure first. God's people throughout Scripture often go against the flow. And that's what Paul encourages us to do when he says in Romans 12, verse 2, Do not be conformed to this world, but transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Or as J.B. Phillips' translation puts it, don't let the world squeeze you into its own mold. And they didn't. And in verse 18 it says, Let it be known to you, O king, we do not serve your God. Let me translate that. They're saying, we serve a sovereign God who can deliver us. And he will deliver us in life or by death. Either way, it's a deliverance from you, O king. I think that's remarkable. They're looking at it as a win-win situation. They weren't doubting God's ability to save them, but were reassured that he would one way or another. Back to chapter 3, verse 19. Then Nebuchadnezzar was full of fury. And the expression on his face changed toward Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He spoke and commanded that they heat the furnace seven times more than it was usually heated. Have you ever had that happen? Have you ever been in a conversation with somebody and they're tracking with you and then suddenly you say something they don't like and it's written all over their face? They contort and you can just see it. Uh-oh. They don't like what I just said. Verse 20. And he commanded certain mighty men of valor who were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and cast them into the burning fiery furnace. Then these men were bound with their coats, in their coats, their trousers, their turbans, and their other garments and were cast into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Now this is the third time it's mentioned that they were bound or tied up and cast into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Therefore, because the king's command was urgent and the furnace is exceedingly hot, the flame of the fire killed those men who, stood, who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. A little bit of overkill there. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down, bound into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished, and he rose in haste and spoke, saying to his counselors, Did we not cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? And they answered and said to the king, True, O king. Look, he answered, I see four men, loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they're not hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. They were bound but now they're loosed. The three were thrown in, and now they see four. And it says the fourth looks like the Son of God. You see, Nebuchadnezzar was not a Trinitarian. He didn't have the benefit of the New Testament, and he didn't understand the concept of the Son of God as you and I do. He simply saw some other form, some godlike deity or angelic apparition walking with other, the other three men who are now loosed in the midst of the burning fiery furnace. And what's amazing to me is that these guys are not trying to get out. In fact, and you'll see this in a minute, they have to be asked to get out by the king. They're just walking around, hanging out, talking, in fellowship with this fourth, fourth personage, and just having a time. Verse 26, Then Nebuchadnezzar went near the mouth of the burning fiery furnace and spoke, saying, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, 
Come out and come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came from the midst of the fire, and the satraps, administrators, governors, and the king's counselors gathered together, and they saw these men on whose bodies the fire had no power. The hair of their head had not singed, nor were their garments affected, and the smell of the fire was not on them. And Nebuchadnezzar spoke, saying, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who sent his angel and delivered his servants to the tr who trusted in him. And they have frustrated the king's word and yielded their bodies that they should not serve nor worship any god except their own god. Therefore I make a decree that any people, nation, or language which speaks anything amiss against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces, and their houses shall be made as ash heaps. Because there is no other god who can deliver like this. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. So I wonder if you realize how monumental this is. In chapter 2, remember, the same king 16 years earlier, though he had forgotten by now, said, Your God is the God of gods. He's the Lord of kings. And now this king makes it into law. He makes it a crime if, if committed if you say anything against the Jewish God. Well, just think how important this is. This is Babylon. This is ancient Iraq and Iran. And we all know how they feel about Israel today. So think how pro-Israel or pro-God of Israel this king is in these ancient times. And why was he? because the testimony of three men who stood up and made an impact on this pagan king, their life was preached. Your life can preach more eloquently than any sermon you could ever come up with, especially as you suffer and you trust God in the midst of your suffering. It will be impressive not only to Christians, but to non-believers as well. They look at you while you're experiencing suffering while you're in the midst of your fiery trial, your ordeal, and they see you clinging and trusting and rejoicing in the Spirit, boggles their minds. It's an enigma to them, number one, but it's also impressive to them, number two. So I'd like to close by giving you three takeaways, three principles that emerge from what we've read tonight in these 30 verses. The first one is, standing up for God is always better than bowing down to man. But it's always harder. Nobody likes to stick out like a sore thumb. It's harder to swim up against the current than it is just to float with it. It's better, but it's harder. And because of that, you should ready yourself for that. So that if somebody yells at you, or disses you because you're a believer, or persecutes you, you won't be taken by surprise. There was a man in the 4th century by the name of Athanasius who did exactly that. He made himself ready so that he would not be surprised. He stood before a council. Now, Athanasius was a patriarch in Alexandria in the Holy Roman Empire. And he believed in the deity of Christ, as Scripture says, and the Trinity, and the nature of God. But there was another man at the council named Arius. He was a heretic. He denounced the deity of Christ and the Trinity. And at one point in this heated meeting, Arius stood up and said, Athanasius, look how many are against you. The whole world is against you. To which... Athanasius replied, if the whole world goes against the truth, then Athanasius will go against the world. He readied himself for that. We should ready ourselves. We should stand up and stay standing and not falter. It's better to stand up for God than to bow to man, but it's always harder. Secondly, 
God is always sovereign, whether the outcome is triumph or tragedy. I'll take you back again to verses 17 and 18. Our God can deliver us, and he will. But if not, we will not bow. It's so important that we grasp this truth. In other words, if we get delivered, he's sovereign. But if we die, he's sovereign. Some like to think if trouble is avoided or you get delivered from a calamity, God's sovereignty is upheld. But if the bottom drops out of your life and there's pain and suffering and loss of life, there goes the sovereignty of God. Not true. He is sovereign no matter what. And that's why we get so fearful when somebody would ask us during a tragedy, you believe in God? What kind of a God would, of love would allow this? What kind of God is this? The answer, this is a sovereign God who gives and takes away. And listen to the words of Job who lost ten of his children in one day and his own health, and yet he fell down and worshipped God. In chapter 1, verse 21, he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I shall return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He gives and he takes away. He gives and he takes away. And in Romans 8, verse 28, is a promise we often land on. And it says there, and we, now, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Notice, it doesn't say all things will feel good. It doesn't say all things will seem good to you at that moment. But all things will work together for your good. Now, the scripture is not some fairy tale that promises you a fairy tale ending. A happily ever after, if you will. A white picket fence with a cherry on top. That's not scripture. God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. I've discovered that there are times, especially lately, that plan doesn't feel very wonderful. It feels like people sticking needles in your neck, snipping off parts of your ear. It doesn't feel like a wonderful plan at all. But we have to have faith that God will see us through these tragedies and through these sufferings and know that he's in control and that no matter what, he will deliver us either back to this world in life or to him and his presence in death. He's sovereign. When God says no, he is a sovereign and loving God just as much as when he says yes. When God takes away, he's to be worshipped as much as when God pours out and gives. And these three guys knew it. And they weren't concerned. The answer is no. And here's the third and final principle, and we'll close here. Suffering is the doorway to freedom. Now I'm going to bring you back again to something that we noticed as we read the text. And it is at this point in time, four times in the text, the word bind or bound is used. That is, they tied these guys up with ropes and threw them into the fire. And Nebuchadnezzar looks down and says, wait a minute, didn't we throw these in three guys tied up? How come I see four loosed? Here's the principle. The only thing the fire burned is what bound them. Their clothes didn't burn. Their hair didn't burn. Their flesh didn't burn. They didn't even smell like smoke. The only thing that burned were those ropes that tied them up. And that is why we need adversity in life, because adversity frees us from certain bondages that we have been living under. So I leave you with this. Our sovereign God gives and takes away. He blesses and he disciplines. And he does it all for a purpose. Some of that purpose you may discover right away and some you may not discover for many years. 
And part of it you will never discover until he himself tells you when you're on the other side. But for me, that's a place of rest. That's a place of peace. And in the meantime, even though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we will fear no evil, for the Lord is with us. Let's pray. Father, our desire is to just be strong in your behalf, Lord, that you give us the tools in your word and the strength and the conviction and the faith that we have in you, knowing that you are a loving God, that you do have a wonderful plan for our lives, Lord, that we would stand up, that we would stick out, that we would swim upstream rather than float downstream with everybody else. I pray that for the children as well, Lord, as they're starting a new school year, that they would uh, be a light to those kids around them, Lord, their peers, that they would be able to unashamedly say, I am a Christian and I'm raised in a Christian home. I thank you for chapter 3. I look forward to chapter 4. I thank you that you have blessed this body with a, with a, a, a conviction of teaching your word, Lord. So I just pray that that would continue, that this body would continue to grow as a result of it, and that your will will be done regardless of what we may face, Lord. We thank you and we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen.